All right, I'm going to hand it over for questions. Um, who's got some questions? Anybody wanting to weigh in on anything that um, Sandy said in the meantime while we're waiting for some folks to get microphones? I did just want to quickly microphone? say um, the Melbourne Press Club did just get DGR <laughs> status and we're oh, no. working towards um, funding some fellowships through that obviously not quite on the scale of what's happening in the US. It'll be a fair while before we get those sort of donations yeah. behind us or, or enough donations behind us. But after a battle, sure. we did get DGR status at the at the press club, I assume. The Walkley Foundation is working towards something yeah. similar. Well, we have, yeah. Oh, you have as well? Yeah. yeah. The yeah. Foundation has it, yeah. Just need to get more money in to yes. <laughs> yeah. make it, to turn it into something. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Okay, I'll grab the mic again and then we'll just hand it around. Okay, this man, yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I'm glad that uh, Ben mentioned corporate interest a number of times. Uh, but one of the things that I find particularly about the mainstream media is it never talks about corporate capitalism as being the source of many of our problems. And, and I'll, I'll direct my uh, question to you, Karen. Uh, I watch the ABC. I watch the ABC for the news in the morning. Occasionally, I watch Q&A. And very seldom do I, I see a discussion, a serious discussion of, of capitalism uh, on, on the ABC. And, and I know and my, my, my criticism is coming from the left rather than the right. The ABC gets it from the right all the time. But it doesn't go very far to the left. So, so why? Uh, I, I'm, I'm reminded of Noam Chomsky, who many years ago with uh, Herman wrote a book about the ma mainstream media <coughs> manufacturing consent. So I would say, from what I see, from my vantage point, the ABC and the SBS, which are better than the commercial stations, uh, still are very much part of manufacturing consent. But I'd like to get your thoughts on that. Well, I, I'm not sure that the discussion, uh, what exactly you would want us to be saying. You want us to slice and dice capitalism. I think the ABC does a pretty good job in showing a lot of corporate rip-offs. Um, we are more likely to cover corporate fraud stories than most others. You know, perhaps not Four Corners? The, yeah. yeah, Four Corners does a lot of that kind of forensic kind of thing. But in terms of trying to slay capitalism, I don't think we're, anybody's at that stage anymore. I mean, um, but there's no doubt we can all be doing a better job in keeping corporates to account, um, for sure. But uh, we're limited in resources, uh, we're uh, ever, under ever more pressure uh, when it comes to budgets. We've also got a huge remit, you know, we've got to make every Australian happy at some point, and I can assure you it's not easy. Come on, chop, based chop. On, yeah, based on my email, it's, it's like, you know, feedback, and it's just somebody's rant and rave about, you know, the death penalty for something. It's just extraordinary. So um, I, I can understand your frustration, uh, uh, but I'm not sure that, the, that capitalism per se is something that we're going to tackle because we're in it. But I do think we do a better job than most. Um, sure, we can be doing more. And, and, you know, we are going to be spread ever thinner at the ABC as the, the next round of cuts mm. come in. So um, does anybody else want to kind of weigh in? Yeah, Ben, here we go. Um, so, I mean, I, I don't think we can expect um, nine the nine... Fairfax Network now merged, um, currently chaired by Peter Costello, to be particularly anti-capitalist, for example. So I don't think it should be too much of a surprise that for-profit media uh, are not particularly anti-capitalist. Uh, the only thing I wanted to say um, further than that is that we do have a fairly strong check and balance in Australia with a strong public media sphere. We have the ABC and SBS. We also have a fairly strong independent media sphere with people like Sandy. Um, and... Um, Finally, um, something that might pique your interest, I understand that Jacobin, the socialist website, is starting up an Australian arm sometime next year, so perhaps that would be the, the outlet in which you could read about the evils of capitalism on a regular basis. Also, don't worry, I know exactly where to go. Yeah, yeah, good, good. <laughs> We've got a lady here who's got a question. Excuse me, I'm giving you a question asked. Oh, this is fabulous, good job. <laughs> Um, my name's Liz, and I'm from Extinction Rebellion, and I think the, the reason why Extinction Rebellion has taken off so powerfully... Could you explain what that is? I apologise. I don't know what Extinction Rebellion is. Ah. Does anybody else know what Extinction uh, Rebellion is? Climate change, Chris. Oh, oh, sorry. Okay. okay. A, sorry, I've not heard of that particular term. Apologies. Yeah. Ignore me. Um, it has a novel set of characteristics 
uh, to Flannery wrote in the conversation on Tuesday that he's realised that his decades of struggling to get a sensible climate policy has failed blatantly. Um, and um, so we need to, uh, the, some of the characteristics of peaceful civil disobedience and citizens assembly, regenerative culture, and it's global. So when I talk to kids, there are so many alienated young people feeling powerless and hopeless. And I feel I can say to them that it is possible because of its novel set of characteristics, <coughs> it might work, whereas everything that's been done up till now hasn't. So my question is, um, the media, how, what do we need to do to treat this like an emergency, like the Second World War? We need to treat this like an emergency. It's not business as usual. So how do we do that? Well, I think the, there are a couple of things that I'll, I'll weigh in initially, is that if you think that some of the coverage, whether it's in the newspapers or on radio or on television, are wrong, and there are too many climate deniers or there's false equivalents or whatever, Australia has an extraordinarily strong um, culture and lots of organisations that you can complain to. You complain to the ABC, there's quite a process I have to go to to actually respond to that. There's the commercial broadcasting regulator. Now, some of them, you know, are perceived to be toothless tigers, but the more people that actually complain, use your civil rights and actually, you can't, but you can't just, like, the feedback to my email, which is, you know, burn this guy in hell. You actually have to come up with a, I saw your story on this night, and it did this, this, and this. Where was the X? Where was the belt? You actually need to outline what your complaint is. But we have a really quite rigorous complaint system in Australia. Um, it could be better, but so use your civil roles in that way, I would say. You know, uh, uh, lobby your MP, lobby the people around you. Uh, so there are ways that you can ensure that there's better coverage, fairer coverage, etc. Anybody else want to weigh in? Look, thanks, Liz, and despite your nerves, you did very well. So, um, uh, look, can I just make a general point? I, when I was an MP, I, I often used to say to people when discussing issues um, like free speech and diversity of viewpoints that I, I, I am a Liberal Party member and I have strong convictions like I'm sure all of you do, but I always made the point I wasn't elected just to represent the people who agree with me. And so when I'm meditating on questions of media freedom, I'm not looking at whether I want a media that just supports my view. Now, I know there are strong views. I get, I get that very clearly. But what we should be aiming for is a media that's as free as it can be. Because it's going to entail views you may detest. It's going to entail the airing of, uh, you know, as I said, viewpoints, uh, convictions, uh, campaigns that you're going to look at and recoil at because you just don't agree with them. And equally, your viewpoints might do the same to others. But the, for me, putting aside the substantive debates that inevitably exist around very important issues, like our climate, like our environment, uh, like our future, uh, the it's question not for me fact, is... Fact, it's not an but, opinion. But, that's, but you're never going to win that, Liz. For me, the issue is, is the media as free as it can be? And do we have a, what I'll call loosely, there's no intent, pun intended, a media market that people are free to in, uh, participate in. Are you telling me that you would be happy with a media that did not allow the airing of views you detest? And putting aside incitement, all those sorts of things. Views you just think are wrong? Because for me, I wouldn't want to live in a world where views I disagree with can't be aired. And, and as I said, I'll, I'll finish on where I started, which is I wasn't just there to represent the people who agree with me. We've got to be prepared in an age where we assume that polarity and dysfunction bars reasonable and civil debate, we've got to be prepared to hop into the marketplace or the public square and understand there are people who disagree and we might feel very strongly about issues. We don't have time. All right, well, um, there was actually a gentleman down here. Sorry, so guys, that was a long answer. I took too much time. <laughs> Uh, maybe I'll just jump in quickly. I mean, I agree with you. Like that, that, that there's a climate emergency, and we're, you know, it, it's a devastating, terrifying time for someone who has, uh, who's a parent of, of young children. But 
But actually, I actually agree with John. I don't think this can be solved by the media. This is, a, this is for citizens to take charge with exactly what X, XR is trying to do. It's, it's, now, it's beyond the media now. It's about civil disobedience. It's about um, actually taking over the streets and making uh, the current status quo no longer tenable because that's the only thing that's going to work, in my opinion. Um, I, for one, am very supportive of the media because as a practising lawyer, every, with every annual trust um, uh, survey, that comes out, <laughs> lawyers, do lawyers do far better than the media. And, uh, Outrageous. Uh, with real estate agents. Congratulations. Um, taking where you can find them. Uh, look, uh, I agree with a lot of the uh, things that have been said about the what the positives of the media are and the, the, the problems. And as a, I would say, a libertarian, my suspicion of government is almost endless. Um, but I do, I, is this not an element of the chickens coming home to roost for the media? I believe that there's an, an, a perception of smugness uh, in the media that's per, that, that the, the, the population see and it turns them off. I think part of that is being media talking to media about media about issues as if they're all experts. I mean, you know, Lisa talks to Laura Tingle, and uh, you know the panel talks to Peter Van Onselen, and all of these people talk and they talk about stuff that really doesn't matter at all to most people. And then there's the gotcha moments that that people find very irritating, uh, and they really and the the amount of. Uh, uh, reportage that actually is more analysis. Uh, many opinion pieces are just someone's views on something. And I think in that sense, the media has drifted to this a little bit of um, self-referentialism, um, self-importance. You know, we're a bigger player in the game than, than we should be. And, and that has uh, led to a lack of trust in the media. And, um, uh, I, and as a practicing lawyer, of, uh, I practice in defamation. I agree with the comments about defamation, but I've had I've tangled with current affair, and you know the quality of their reporting. Well, let's call it reporting, uh, just for the sake of argument, <laughs> is is quite disgraceful. But they've taken up they, they pick a target, some punter who they think hasn't, isn't, hasn't got any money to go with, and they go after them. You know, quality of the the reportage. You know, one, one, and you wonder what don't wonder why judges say really. You know, and add a zero to the, to an award. So that's, those are my thoughts. I'd be interested in your your response. Was there a question? Yeah, or no? What are your thoughts about that? <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you believe that there's an element of smugness and I'll, I'll um, uh, yeah. uh, self-referentialism that's happening in the media? There's a question. Uh, just on one point, the smugness now. You know, now we're in the digital age, digital media. What I think it's a it's a real pity that journalists haven't sort of picked up the advantage of digital media because, you know, we, we, you can now jump on the comments thread and have a say, right? And it, it's... I, I find it really disappointing, you know, to go through some of those comments threads and the journalist doesn't respond. You know, the whole point of it is, you know, if someone's going to make a comment, at least respond. And I believe there are not enough journalists doing that. And I really think with the digital age, it's time really for all journalists to come down from their ivory towers, cross the moat and join the throng. Because, boy, you can learn an awful lot from people out there who often know more about the subject than you do. And could be, you know, uh, that person could be the pivotal point for a new story or a new chapter um, and, you know, I, anyone who writes for us, I, you know, I'm all, I won't say nag, I'll say nudge them. Just make sure that you respond to any of the comments. And I was very pleased when Michael West was down here a few weeks ago uh, giving a talk to the um, Victorian Women's Trust. Um, I was watching, he was staying at my place and I was watching him with the phone and I said, what on earth are you doing with your phone all that time? He said, well, I, I have to answer at least 100 responses on Twitter. I said, well, don't let me stop you because I seriously believe that's what we should do. So, 
one of, one of the ways to win over the public is to start engaging more with the public. Uh, I think we, we do do a lot more engaging now than ever before through things like Twitter, maybe not replying to each of the comments, yeah. but um, if you start to reply to some of the, the things on Twitter, things can very quickly spiral down into this nasty, nasty, nasty stuff. The abuse. I, what, what are you talking about? It's <laughs> so nasty. Puts you off reply to any of the tweets, frankly. But um, I think one of the, the reasons perhaps that journalists don't necessarily do as much of that as, as I agree with you would be good to do, reply to all the messages in the comments sections of, of uh, posts from the stories or the, the Herald Sun website or the Age website where you can put the comments down the bottom, is purely <coughs> they're really time poor. Mm, We're all yeah, time poor, absolutely. but they're really time yeah. poor. They're, um, we, we share offices, or we used to share offices at Media House with The Age, and when we, when we all moved in, AW was on the top floor, The Age had maybe two floors and the Financial Review another half a floor. They shrunk to half a floor before they moved over to the nine offices. They were much smaller staff, way more demands on their time. Um, they've still got to fill just as many centimetres of the paper around the diminishing ads um, that are appearing. Really time poor. Ideally, yeah, we'd love to. You'd love to always be replying to all of those for those very good reasons. That's just one of the reasons, well, two of the reasons, the nastiness of the trolls and um, the time poor um, challenges facing the journalists. I would say I agree. I, I would agree with you. There, there's lots of bad journalists, um, no doubt about it. Like there are bad journalists and bad police and bad everything. So look, um, no bad lawyers. Then, though. Sorry, there's no <laughs> bad lawyers. <laughs> no you bad guys are amazing. <laughs> oh, I do <laughs> disagree. <laughs> so, so look, there's definitely that. You know, there's, there's, and you know, there are way, way, way too many commentators who pretend to be journalists who are writing about things that you know they've heard about third or fourth hand. So, um, hmm. but. Uh, yeah, to Heidi's point, um, you know, and, and Sandy, just like, you know, I don't engage with a lot of them because I'm sick of threats, you know, mm. like I just won't yeah. engage because I'm a woman and suddenly I'm up for death threats, rape threats, whatever it might be if I dare to have an opinion. So I will engage to a certain degree, but the first thing I do as soon as some, and it's usually a guy, um, will, you know, say something, it's block, it's report, it's, you mm. know, so um, the, I, read, I, think, I think there are journalists and there are journalists. So um, it's it's there's you know it's not all of us it's not all of the time so I guess I would say that anybody else want to weigh in on that one or should we go to another question? Okay. No, I agree, I agree, Karen. Yeah. All right, I've got a question over here. Hi, the question is to the panel. Uh, my name is Daniel. I'm a student of politics here at Melbourne. Now it was referenced that there was challenges in terms of getting people to pay for content that's being produced. What I'm like to know is what's the opinion of the panel whether or not that problem Or is there another reason why people are having trouble getting people paid? Uh, that's an excellent uh. question, really excellent question. Um, I think we, the industry's made a rod for its own back in putting so much content out there for free in the first place. So that's that's been a big problem. At the ABC, obviously, we can't charge for um, content because we're taxpayer funded. So there's that kind of anomaly as well. So we have this weird situation where um, we can't actually charge. Uh, so, so there, there, there's a, there's some institutional or historical issues that are a part of the problem. Uh, there's so much out there that weeding it out and, and the um, quality side of it is hard for sure. But part of it is not being able to get the right status where you can actually have people donate to you and, and get a tax deduction if you're not actually going to play through a paywall at The Guardian or whatever it is. I subscribe to a lot of different um, kinds of journalism in different ways. I've got to get onto Michael and make a, a donation. I was going through your website. So well, you can it. subscribe for free. Oh, I don't know, have I to also make a donation. Right. So the two are quite separate. That's right, but, but I believe in journalism and I believe in good journalism. So, And that's something we actually have to ask, ask ourselves. And it's partly, I'm a director of the Walkley Board and the Walkleys is a, the foundation that runs the Walkley Awards and it's about excellence in journalism. And you know we're trying to uh, fundraise and we've got charitable status to be able to fund public interest journalism. Um, but getting, I think, to Ben's point earlier, it's just that it's, it can't just be for investigative journalism, it actually has to be for local journalism. Some of the best journalists I know in this town 
um, uh, the local ones who are left. So we actually have to ask ourselves as citizens, what are we prepared to pay? What price for journalism? Uh, because it is important. So I would ask each and every one of you to run the ruler over what you are paying for in terms of your journalism uh, that you actually um, consume and perhaps think about digging in your pocket a little more to find the, the Michael West or some of the other really quality uh, organisations out there. That even if you're not going to read each and everything they write and produce, it's important to know that it's there. Um, I would say... I'm thinking of the Herald Sun for no particular reason <laughs> here, but um, a lot of the um, headlines will be clickbait. Will you click on those? They put those behind the subscriber wall. They put them there for a reason. People will click on that clickbait to see the Bachelor whatever or the... Uh, I can't think of an example off the top of my head right now. I'm very tired. <laughs> but um, clickbait, you're not going to pay for something quality that sounds quite dry. People will go to read that smutty, foolish, nonsense waste of newspaper, um, waste of news ink, but they might not necessarily click on a story that has a, a perfectly worthy, well-investigated, well-resourced, well-researched piece of material behind it if it hasn't got some sexy clickbait on it. Um, I, I don't know what the answer to that is, but people are clearly clicking on it. You're delivering, so places like the Herald Sun website must be delivering what people want to click on. They're putting it behind a paywall, people must be paying for it. Mm. Good point. Um, I think we should tax the tax giants um, and use that Great money idea. to fund yes. uh, both investigative journalism and culture. Um, I think there should be a flat 25% lobby uh, levy uh, on all... Uh, non-Australian technology. Uh, we already have a 55% content quota on mainstream television. There's no content quota at all on online. Um, so it's really a question of political will. Um, if we were able to do that, we could probably generate around about $2 billion a year, which would alleviate some of the problems that have been caused by Facebook and Google essentially capturing the entire online digital advertising spend in this country. So they've created literally a duopoly, um, as the ACCC is documented, um, and it's really up to our politicians to act to break up that overweening corporate power. Mm, I agree. Mm. Yeah. We have another question up here. If I may, a comment and question. Um, my comment is, so back in 2004, I studied media and communications here, which was um, Melbourne Uni's uh, version of journalism. And uh, I distinctly remember a lecturer who had been a journalist saying to us, don't bother being a journalist, there are no jobs for journalists. That was in my first year. I was really disheartened because I was going to be a journalist. And actually, as it happens, two out of that cohort have become journalists. <laughs> one a media personality. How many all up? And the rest, maybe it was 90 in, in here, or maybe a little bit more than that. Um, and the rest of us have become, like I'm a communication specialist in a super fund um, and so I, think, I guess people have gone into kind of more in-house and agency roles um, and saved their opinion for Facebook and the occasional LinkedIn article, LinkedIn post, pardon, I'm here, and here and um, so anyway um, my question is a bit to do with culture really I mean um, so I can't help but think that part of these issues are a bit to do with our culture, um, you know, um, whether in our education system, whether we're kind of getting students to kind of really pay attention and really value the media. Um, like my other major, apart from media and communications, was French, and so I spent some time in France, and I, I couldn't help but notice, you know, that the French love their media, you know, um, and yet they even have a quota for, you know, local cultural content for TV and so on. So um, my question, which I was trying, trying to formulate, is kind of to what extent do you think our culture, this, the current Australian culture, um, has to do with this state of affairs? Uh, it strikes me that we need to go back to civics lessons, where people actually need to understand how our system works more generally, and it's politics. It's, you know, where people think they're actually electing a prime minister that we've got a problem. So I think we've got some real issues about understanding how our society and our democracy works. And that's a big part of us. We're not doing a good enough job actually explaining what we do, and we talk about shining light, and we talk about 
you know, holding mirrors as Ben was talking about earlier, but what we really do is actually, you know, we actually do the hard work for you. You know, you can go to the local council meeting, you can go to all manner of things, but we're actually the ones doing the hard work for you and we're writing it generally in a professional, engaging way. So, you know, it is actually uh, a profession that we do, but I think it's not well understood what we do. And, and it's um, easy to be caught up in the Trumpisms of, you know, enemies of the state. And that's something we really need to worry about as an industry is actually becoming perceived as the enemy rather than uh, people who are helping and, in, in fact, informing. So I would like to see us go back to some pretty basic civic lessons. Um, thoughts on what we can do? Yeah. I didn't get your first name, sorry. Georgia, thanks, Georgia. Um, two years ago, my eldest daughter, who's doing VCE now, did uh, work experience at a newspaper, major newspaper, and I tried very hard to convince her to go into journalism. But she came away from there um, quite discouraged because of journalists, not just at that paper, but everywhere, talking the industry down. I tried to encourage her heading in the performing arts direction now, but um, which is kind of similar in some ways, but. Uh, I, I believe there's a future for journalism. And I, I said to my daughter, look, like any field, whether it's the law, uh, which I'm back in now, it's surprising, having left politics, I'm now a lawyer. and um, Did you go people, down the list? Well, people now Trust. wave to me with all five fingers, which is good. <laughs> um, politicians, you think journos get it hard. Politicians, that's not my joke. I'm stealing that joke, I should say. Um, but the industry has to talk itself up. And I, I remember, um, if I can be maudlin for just one moment, uh, I remember in the f last press conference I did as a, an MP on the way out, and I talked to journalists about um, the importance of the industry. And one thing you don't hear the your industry talk a lot about is why journalists are important and why their why their standing should be important. A good think about what a good journalist offers. A good journalist is someone who's held up in high esteem, someone who is trusted, someone who works really hard talking to lots of people to get a fair and honest assessment of a particular issue or story. And you know it as a politician, you know who the good journalists are because they're ringing up, they're thorough, they're trustworthy. If they say something's off the record, it's off the record or on background. Or if they say they'll honour something, they'll honour it. You know who they are over time. So just two things I'd, I'd leave you with, George, is I think the industry is strong and it will always have a future. But I'd love to see, particularly the good journos um, and the industry itself, talk the profession up. And it is, at its best, it is a noble profession. And it ought to be, and it better be, because we have to trust journalists. So <laughs> that's what I'd say about, uh, about the industry. Yeah, I would say that I love my job. It's so fun. That every day there's something different. There's someone new to talk to or some angle to chase. There's no better day than when you have found something in a report or you've, you've caught out um, a public statement that completely contradicts something from a year or two earlier and you're the only one that's got the tape of it. You're the only one that's made the connection and you get to do that on the radio. You get to, to write that for the, for the, um, for the website. I love it. I don't understand why people don't want to be journalists. It, it kills me that your lecturers were saying, nah, none of you will, the industry's not worth it. Get out. You don't tell people that, do you? In your class. <laughs> 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 it's, it's a wonderful profession to be part of. Leaving aside all of the <laughs> issues of the nobility of the profession and that sort of, it's, it's just fun. I yeah. love it. I'm sure Karen feels the same. You, it doesn't feel like a drudgery of a nine to five job in an office, putting things into a keyboard or whatever office people do. I don't know. I have fun. <laughs> I mean, I obviously love journalism because it's not even my job and I'm still doing it. So, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, largely in my spare time because I can't help myself. Um, so, and I mean, I think that's worth, that's a point worth making. You know, there are many more musicians than there are professional people who get, you know, make a living out of, out of their art in this country. There's, there's hundreds of thousands of people who pursue, um, you know, various cultural pastimes because they love it, you know. And, and there's there's plenty of people out there who are doing citizen journalism now and doing citizen journalism of a very high quality. Mm. So um, you don't need uh, a media membership to you don't need a media card. You don't need to, you know, <laughs> have your <laughs> But you don't, you don't need to, to have a lanyard around your neck to, to be a journalist. You know, it, 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 journalism is, is actually an activity. It's about asking questions, um, and it's about asking the next question. 
and, and, I, and I hope that, that people will continue to do that because it is important. Yes, and I have to say I love it. I really enjoy it. I should have retired years ago. I can't give it up, you know. I mean, how long am I going to keep doing this till I'm 80 or something? Well, there's another 30 keep years. So. Oh, thanks. I will vote for you if you ever You're go a politician. <laughs> but, uh, look, I used to work in public relations and uh, writing um, speeches for the Lord Mayor and press releases. You know, it, it was just constant weasel words. You know, I knew them all. I had the vocab. Um, and uh, doing journalism, it was like, I always say, it, you know, it's like coming out from the dark side, really, from public relations to journalism. So um, I worry that... Good. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I've come over from the dark side <laughs> to journalism. <laughs> Just make clear about that. So um, it's interesting that there are an awful lot of journos out there who once worked in public relations and... And that it's just so good to be able to get out there and write the truth. <laughs> we have one last question. All right, I relate to Liz on a spiritual level when she said that I that she's not the question asking person. But uh, this question really reflects on my morals, and I want to know if when it, and I don't mean to put a negative light on news agencies and journalists, but I want to know if racial biases are a thing when it comes to journalism and news agencies. Um, you know. Being on social media, I see it a lot, and I want to know not if it reflects your views personally, but more so is this like a factor when it comes to journalism and news agencies publishing stories? Um, I think there's, I think it, we can't deny that there's definitely been racial profiling from some of our um, groups and racial targeting. Um, and we don't have a diverse enough industry, and I think this table says everything about where our industry is at. Um, you know, and and I don't, you know, um, I, I understand that. You know, we at the ABC we're constantly trying to find diverse candidates for our jobs, and and I go into schools and say to young Muslim women, it's, yeah, I did go to your school, that's right. It's just like, come and be a journalist, it's great. I know your mum and dad want you to be doctors, lawyers, and accountants, but come and be a journalist because we're gonna have so much fun. Not one of you's come in yet, I'm not mad, but. Mm -hmm. um, but no, we know we've got a diversity problem, but doing something about it is actually really hard. And we are trying, but it's it's getting candidates and, and people interested. But um, yes, definitely sections of the media, I think, uh, are blatant about it. Again, I would say to those in communities who are affected, complain. Use the mechanisms that you have at the press council or the broadcasting, or I'm not even sure what they're, half of them are called, but... Um, you know, there are organisations you can complain to about that. The Human Rights Commission, you actually need to make noise. You need to take up space. Um, but um, I, th I think some of the racial stuff is deliberate. I think most of it is probably actually ignorant and, and silliness and us not knowing enough. But please um, hold us to account. Take us to task. Yeah, certainly complain and certainly apply. Apply for jobs. Apply, 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 Knock on the door. Come yeah. on in. <laughs> Always. You've got to be in it. Oh, sorry. Uh, well, I thought it was a media thing. I'm happy to comment at the end. Yeah, no, I was oh. just Oh, I, I can say hand on heart, I haven't had a um, single Muslim applicant come in. I haven't had a single applicant of any different ethnicity come in and ask for a job with us. I haven't been approached at all. Um, Have you sought any out? Yeah. I create three and a half hours of live radio content every day. I work a 10 hour day already. When should I seek out? I can't go and find people to apply for jobs if 
people aren't applying for jobs. Three, I'm three talking a, about me in particular. Yeah, I don't I don't know about the does um, management. Does 3AW have a diversity policy or any kind of diversity hiring practices? I'll have to check. I don't do the hiring. Oh. Mm. Uh, I'll come oh. there, Gabin, and I'll come back. Um, yeah, well, it's a massive problem in the media, and you only have to turn on your television at night to see it. Um, you know, and, and I think um, we, the media's had a massive blind spot about diversity, massive, and it still has, I think. Um, and, and yeah, it's not, a, it's not enough to say lean in, apply. Um, you know, it's, it's actually up to the media to take steps to hire people of colour, uh, more women, um, Indigenous journalists. And yeah, there is the talent out there, don't worry about that. Um, look at some of the, the Indigenous journalists coming through who've been nurtured by NITV and SBS in recent years. We've got some absolute top talent. So it, I'm actually really optimistic in some respects, um, seeing some of the journalism coming through from um, some of the, the younger Indigenous and um, you know, uh, people of colour coming through our media scape. Um, you know, it's probably unfair to single people out, um, so I won't. But but there is there's a whole cohort of, of talent coming through, and so that is, I think, at least something to be optimistic about. But you know, the, the media is is apart from anything else, it's a power structure, and so powerful people don't like to give up their power. They have to be made to give up their power. So it's it's a struggle. It's a fight. Uh, you know, I work in a university. Uh, it's, it's supposedly all about, you know, diversity and it's got mandated policies for HR and that we're always going to meetings about unconscious bias and, and how to break down the gender barriers. We've got, we've got people in my department who are professors of gender studies and yet if you do the maths, if you look at who's in my department and who is in the positions of power, they are white men. So we are talking about an endemic problem across our society. Candy. <clears throat> well, probably as one of the oldest here, I think, today, um, the things are changing, but they're changing awfully slowly. Um, it's taken an awful long time for women to be taken seriously in a lot of jobs. Uh, I can re remember years ago working in PR. I was a single mother with a child, and uh, the company were having to... Uh, um, I suppose um, acclimatised to tough economic conditions and uh, a couple of us had to go. Um, I was asked to go and I said, why? Because I felt that I was clearly offering more than the fellow who was going to stay and they said, well, because he's a family man and you're not. Mm. And I said, I'm a single mother. Oh, yes, but he's got a wife. So he had to support a stay-at-home wife, you know. So you remember things like that. So, look, things have changed, but we have a long way to go. And um, in my own family, we are a mixture of atheist, Presbyterian, Catholic, Muslim, uh, Hindu. Um, and, you know, we all... The interesting thing is that we all share the same values... We all get along famously and we can't understand why the rest of the world doesn't. So, uh, <laughs> just... Well, we've still got a long way to go, that's for sure. And, um, I mean, my... The, the, the um, Pakistani Muslim member of our family, um, I'm very, very proud of her. She's just finished her PhD in London. And uh, she calls me Sandy Mum and we have a fantastic relationship. She's always saying, when you're coming over to London, stay with me. Uh, and she, she's out there. She's doing, doing her thing and she belongs to all sorts of organisations to progress the rights of women. Uh, and I say, go for it, you know. But don't give up. <laughs> I think we'll probably leave it there. I think we've kind of... Um, I don't think there are any more questions. Um, I think we've had a very robust discussion. I'd like to thank um, Sandy Keane, Ben Altham, Heidi Murphy and John Pesuto for... Uh, and your great questions tonight as well. So, thank you.